Good afternoon, and uh, thank you, class, for inviting me to speak at this mini symposium. Um, oh my God. <laughs> Uh, concerned with the creativity of drawing, or the ways in which, as has been so marvelously explored uh, by our first speaker, um, the ways in which drawing aids and develops creativity. I want to take a kind of step back and uh, perhaps just uh, make a few remarks uh, about the fundamental nature of drawing, as I see it. Drawing is not only, as we know, the basis and the beginning of all art, architecture and design. But it has, of course, design itself means drawing. But it has an even more fundamental actuality in the definition of what it is to be human. I speak without any animosity towards those forms of art that work with objects and events and that take advantage of the plethora of new technologies available to the creative process and the exercise of the imagination. Neither am I referring to academic drawing, what I shall call, might call academic drawing. Drawing that is, uh, that is developed from the direct study of the cast or the model whose practice, that practice of drawing from the cast of the model, is seen sometimes for reasons beyond me as a sort of moral necessity in the training of artists. Not on the other hand that I have anything against life drawing, which is one of the many means towards the training of perception, but only one among many. In fact, I want to take drawing as one of a number of fundamental activities by means of which humankind first registered presence on the earth. These activities are rhythmic dance, which formalize gesture, incantation and song, which formalized speech, and which led in turn to the heightened expression of poetry and music. Drawing, then, in what I have to say, is an activity we may see also as a metaphor for explorative, expressive, and communicative creativity itself. The digital age began when the first humanoid drew a line with his finger in the soft earth, or indented a shape in the sand, or left a negative imprint in ash of four fingers and a thumb on a cave wall. A mark or a shape registering a presence that had, significant, had significance for others beyond the instrumental. At that moment, Homo erectus became Homo sapiens. This as a consequence not only of conveying a piece of useful information, good hunting that way, water can be found here, but also of expressing something of the ontological wonder of actually being in the world. That phrase of Heidegger's, 
with its emphasis upon the verb, being, seems indispensable to our definition. Awareness of being is the beginning of sociality. Drawing, therefore, we may say, is a primal act of social awareness. David Jones, the Anglo-Welsh artist poet, himself a beautiful draftsman, is helpful here. In a brilliant essay, Use and Sign, he draws a neat distinction between the utile and the sacramental. He takes as an example a distinction between Roman militaristics, ancient Roman militaristics, and ancient Roman Latin poetics. At the outset, he wrote, we are concerned to note that the animal we call man is a creature which from its earliest known beginnings has consistently shown a duality of behavior. We feel justified in calling the creature man not only the supreme utilist, but the only sacramentalist. The Roman legions ordered line a thing of total practicality and devastating utility, ordained towards an end as obvious as are the tactics of a beast of prey, confronts us in history along with the ordered line of the Latin verse form, the hexameter, a thing wholly extra utile and explicable only as a sign. So we may say, if art is a kind of non-utile play, then Homo sapiens is also Homo ludens, man who plays. Knowledge and wisdom begin in play, as does language. No less than natural language which it accompanied into the making of humankind, the kind of play we call drawing is crucial to the human project. It is as definitive of the human as cooking, the manufacture and non-specific use of pottery and physical tools, and the inutile, that is to say the decorative, enhancement of shelter. In the history of all cultures, it has been as indispensable to technological mastery as to the imaginative understanding of the world. Indeed, the one faculty enhances the other. In the visual arts of people across the world, it has occupied a privileged place, valued as the essential underpinning of other kinds of decorative or pictorial work. So universal and ubiquitous an art we take for granted. But every individual, within every generation, within every culture, must begin again at the beginning. In this also, drawing is like language. What is inherited must be assimilated and developed within the biological praxis of the individual being. How many say, I can't draw? It would be as true to say, I can't speak. Drawing, wrote the great American sculptor David Smith is the most direct, closest to the true self, the most natural celebration of man. It may have been the first celebration of man with his secret self, even before song. 
every human being, Smith might have said, paraphrasing Joseph Boyce, every human being is a draftsman. Artists take upon themselves the responsibility of relearning the nature of drawing and developing and extending its possibilities of expression. They reenact professionally what is a natural process. In this way, perhaps, as in others, the practice of the artist demands the survival into adulthood of aspects of childhood. For the artists whose impulses are experimental, for whom art is a kind of research, as it is for drawing, drawing is a mode, I beg your pardon, is a kind of research as it is for children, drawing is a mode of inquiry, a means to invention and discovery. For such an artist, going beyond the bounds of the academic, the critically codified and socially approved modes of drawing requires the discipline and daring of doing things as they have never been done before. The drawing of such modern artists as Clay, Kandinsky, Picasso, Sheila, Marlene Duma, to take one kind of example, Opikabia, Bantongalu, Molinage, Van Doisberg, to take another, has, as we know, tended to the revelatory rather than the descriptive. It belongs to the first category of Klaus Hoek's designations. It is, quote, drawing made to understand a problem. Oddly enough, that is precisely the rationale behind the persistence of life drawing in art academies. Classical drawing of the figure on which the discipline of life drawing is based very often, nevertheless performed Klaus's second function, the demonstration to others of something known to the draftsman, known in this case through the instrumental or quasi-scientific disciplines of dissection and anatomical drawing. It's worth noting that each of the latter group of artists, Clay, I think, could belong in either, but the latter group of Picabia, Van Tongelou, Molinage, Von Doisberg, among many others, whom you would be aware, wrote about their uh, work in precisely those terms that term they were descriptive of reality. Drawing to understand a problem. This is of course really a, a useful simplification to separate production from dissemination. <coughs> knowledge. There's an inexplic inextricable dialectic relation between them. In this respect, drawing may be seen in the figure of a lens. Complicit I know that uh, Klaus has already quoted this statement, but I'll say it again. Complicit with the act of looking, it informs the eye's perception, reflects the world into the seeing mind. Complicit with the act of thinking, it informs, gives form to, the mind's conception refracts the thought into the comprehending world. The artist translates what is, in a sense, invisible. That is, 
not yet seen in a certain aspect, regardless of whether we have looked at it, and renders it actual and visible in the form of marks on paper or on a wall or on the ground or whatever. Mark making is just what drawing is, and no small part of the excitement of drawing for both draftsman and spectator is the magical reduction of visual experience to a physical object. And we may observe this complex excitement in children as they draw. Moments of learning, a wise teacher once said, are moments of joy. And it is observable in children that the moment of learning something new or of discovering something through drawing, they actually exhibit a joy and excitement. No small part of the excitement comes of the knowledge that at that moment we have made a mark on the world. Made our mark, we say, meaning become ourselves visible, significant. Is it not indeed significant that we should use that metaphor? He has made his mark on the world. Drawing, then, is the first creative technology. By manipulation, that is to say, working with the hand of a tool, an object image is created. Something comes into existence that was not there before. <coughs> the world is actually if minutely changed, and with it, our vision of the world is changed. <coughs> the world is everything that is the case, wrote Wittgenstein. With every drawing, the case is altered. Heidegger reminds us that the Greek word from which we derive technique, technology, etc., which closely relates, obviously, to the concept of art, which equals skill at making, and the creating of artifacts, things made with technical skill. Techne originally meant to make appear. And of course, new technologies, being further extensions of human functions, create new possibilities of invention, new constructions, new kinds of making, new kinds of information. New things are made to appear, followed by new kinds of mediation and cultural exchange new kinds of human experience, new kinds, therefore, of human being. Every drawing is a kind of proposition of what is possible, an aspect of being and becoming. Old technologies, of course, persist and develop, and drawing, as I've suggested, is the oldest. Together with language, it remains the most invaluable. When we look at the cave drawings of Chauvet, Lascaux, Altamira, we're looking actually at the products of an advanced technology. For human beings have drawn meaningful marks for millennia before them. In the last analysis, we may think, David Jones's dichotomy between what is utile, useful, instrumental, and what belongs in the realm of the sign 
the sacramental or the poetic collapses. What is, in his term, sacramental, imaginative, non-utile play, the activity of homo ludens, homo sacramentalis, is actually as essential to survival and development of our species as what we think of as instrumental. What exists in our world merely exists until we have named it or drawn it. At that point, it assumes life within our imaginings and meaning in our lives. There is little, very little revealed, brought into visibility, made to appear by technology in our world that is not drawn first, and a great deal in nature that cannot be understood without the attention <coughs> of drawing being paid to it. Drawing is human. Thank you.